Hello everybody. Um, um, I know that there is something at 130 so and there are multiple things at 130 so if you don't mind I would like to go ahead and start so I will have time for everything. I see that you are enjoying your meal so I hope you don't mind if I offer you a small little glass of wine. Now, it won't hurt you, right? It will. So let's see. Uh, low levels of alcohol intake have been associated with reduced stress, anxiety, and tension. I think everybody can agree with that. But it also uh, has been proved that they have very uh, valid antioxidant effects, especially mediated by the molecule uh, resveratrol. Surprisingly, uh, there is also an association with the increased cardiovascular health, especially uh, for the, um, the health of the vessels. You know, the, the vessel seem to be um, more capable to handle uh, uh, rapid uh, uh, blood pressure uh, shifting. There is also an association with the longer life expectancy. This is more of an epidemiological study and is associated pretty much with the um, average consumption of alcohol in some countries that show the longer life expectancy. But, uh, and also the reduced risk of uh, type 2 diabetes. But, on the other hand, yeah, there might be some negative effects, especially on the brain. We all know that alcohol causes addiction, but uh, it also causes some changes in mood and behavior. And it has been associated with increased rate of cell death. The heart, so once again, it's kind of bouncing this. It is high blood pressure, and has been uh, seen an increased rate of uh, uh, cardiomyopathies, arrhythmias, and so forth. And then the liver, which will be the topic of this presentation, pancreatitis, and even cancer, especially in uh, uh, some areas, mouth, total, liver gain. And then finally, it has been associated with uh, uh, weaker immune response. So, when uh, is uh, a level of alcohol intake becoming too much, when it's becoming dangerous? Well, I did some research, and surprisingly, it's not very clear, but let's go uh, step by step. So first of all, it's impressive to notice that uh, the alcohol consumption is responsible for 3.8% of global mortality is among the leading causes of death in Western countries. And uh, clearly is among the, uh, the most pre uh, preventable causes, you know. Um, of course, you know, the, there is also this measurement here, the visibility of just a life years lost due to premature death, which is still a mark 4.6% all around the globe. Of course, it's higher in Western countries. Don't you? So there are two levels of uh, alcohol abuse. One is called binge drinking, which this is the definition. Response to the consumption in 12 hours or less of four more drinks by women and five more drinks by men. So I think we all agree that this cannot be too bad, otherwise most of us would have not made it through college, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, what is the chronic alcohol consumption? So there is no definition. So, what defines an alcoholic? What defines a chronic alcohol abuse? There is no medical definition of that. So, the closest thing that I could find was this one. So, the increased risk of mortality associated with liver cirrhosis among men and women, so no, said, no gender uh, discrimination, uh, seems to be associated with 12, uh, with, uh, 12 to 24 grams of lecanon per day. But I don't say for many days, for how many days. Just like here, they don't say what is the amount of ethanol that you actually assume. They just talk about drink. And there is no definition of the relationship with uh, uh, body mass, ethnicity, but we do know that there are differences related to that. So the definitions are, are not very good here. They're not very precise at least. So what does alcohol do to, to our liver? Either by binge episode, so um, high level of alcohol in, uh, in short times, or by chronic consumption, uh, it has been seen that 80 to 90% of people uh, develop the steatosis. Um, not the microvascular uh, steatosis, but the macro vesicular steatosis. So you could actually see what is called the fat liver by these inclusions here. And the steatosis is silent, no symptoms, asymptomatic, Usually, other than uh, some discomfort during the digestion, you don't really feel anything. 
mean, but uh, by definition, ketosis does not have any clinical symptoms. So, what does promote the passage between steatosis and the uh, clinically relevant condition? So, first of all, um, the first step is the hepatitis, the so-called alcoholic steatohepatitis. Uh, the symptoms might be uh, mild, um, just some digestive problems, or maybe more severe, like zombies and other complications. But there are some uh, histological markers. So, there is a, a, a centrilobular hepatocyte uh, ballooning. Um, another um, marker is some hyaline cords, uh, hyaline and uh, incorporation that are called um, Mallory Bank bodies. And uh, there is this infiltration of uh, uh, poly um, nuclear cells. So basically, there is this abnormal uh, immune response to uh, a liver damage. So at some point, either by the combination of multiple um, infections or other external factors, on uh, the substrate of the steatosis, there is this immune response that generates the alcoholic steatohepatitis. And then, from that point on, there is a progression to fibrosis that has uh, a specific pattern that uh, is called uh, a chicken wire-like pattern in the patients from alcoholic liver disease. And then finally to cirrhosis and eventually also to hepatocellular carcinoma. So these are of course the uh, terminal stages of what is uh, considered a spectrum uh, that is called uh, alcoholic liver disease. But what are the factors that promote these passages? Why from 80 to 90 percent of the heavy drinkers, only 3 or 10 percent finally develop uh, cancer. So, don't be scared, I know this is quite complicated, but uh, I'll try to lead you through this slide uh, uh, during the presentation. So, first of all, uh, we need to focus on uh, this part of the topic here. So, the ethanol goes through uh, the absorption in the, in, in the gut, and then finally through the blood of the lymph, it reaches the, the liver. And in the liver, there are, um, in the body, there are three main pathways. In the liver, there are mostly two. One is this one that is um, arranged by the alcohol dehydrogenase and converts ethanol into acetaldehyde. And the other pathway is the one based on the cytochrome P450 system, particularly the C2E1. Now, the the third pathway is catalyst, but is negligible. <coughs> uh, it, it is usually not involved. It is involved only in very severe uh, inflammation. So the thing is, uh, let's focus on this molecule here, acetyl, acetyl DI, um, because this is actually the main mediator of the liver injury uh, caused by ethanol. And uh, you can see here, uh, it causes, it affects the level of glutathione, which is responsible for the management of most of the um, uh, ROS, the uh, uh, reactive oxygen species. And uh, it, it really mediates all the damage caused by the oxidative stress. But also, it affects the steatosis, and, uh, which is the fat liver. And how does that happen? Well, for that, we need to focus on another branch of this pathway, which goes on this side, and particularly this highlight here. So first of all, there is, in cases with uh, heavy drinkers, we, we notice a high level of homocysteine in blood, and this promotes the so-called uh, uh, endoplasmic uh, stress, and, and uh, endoplasmic particular reticulum stress, which is associated also with increase of RS. The tumor necrosis factor, which is increased in these patients because of the effect of alcohol on the release in circle of uh, lipopolysaccharide, and we'll, we'll go there. But just for now, just keep in mind that the TNF alpha is increased. And this simulates this molecule here as SREDP1C, which is sterile regul regulatory element binding protein 1C which in turn stimulates this other protein, uh, fat acid synthase, and uh, um, CD1, which is uh, uh, sterile coa diacetylase, 
one and uh, PNPLA3, which we'll see in uh, detail in a little bit. And in the end, the effect, the final effect, is the increase of lipogenesis. Now, we have to keep in mind that liver is very important for the balance of the fat acids, the release of uh, simple fat acids or the accumulation of complex fat acids is uh, basically determined by the liver and uh, the liver has a very close interaction with the adipose tissue here. So in the presence of ethanol, we could see the ethanol here, so not just here in the liver. In the presence of ethanol, the uh, adipose tissue releases uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines that uh, repress adiponectin. So adiponectin has an anti-lipogenic effect. So repressing adiponectin basically will remove the anti-lipogenic effect and the final effect is the increase of the accumulation of fat in the liver. But not just fat acids, <coughs> basically what is accumulated is the uh, very low density um, protein, lipoprotein, which are BLDL in the liver cell, in the hepatocytes, and that is what creates the, uh, the vesicles of fat, that is what creates the steatosis in the end. But also, it is inhibit the fat acid oxidation and the export of those fat acids in the blood. So basically, fat acids are not leaving the cells in the liver, but they're actually accumulated and they form this uh, vessel. So we mentioned this in here, and uh, the reason for that is that uh, this gene, this gene, is the only genetic variant that has been proved to be associated with the increased risk of developing ALD, alcoholic liver disease. But not only ALD, also non-alcoholic hepatitis, also hepatocellular carcinoma, also cirrhosis, also fibrosis, also increased risk for um, hepatitis by uh, HIV, ACV, so the hepatitis virus C. There is even weak evidence with the association with the hepatitis virus B. So this SNP here seems to be quite bad, but uh, why, why is it so? Why is it so bad? Why is it associated with so many things? So the gene, that this is the extended name, but I think like phospholipase domain containing three, um, encodes for this protein called adiponutrin, which is basically a gatekeeper. Basically, it decides if the fat acids will go in the cells and then be accumulated and stored, or will leave the cells. And uh, the expression of uh, PN PNELA3 is induced after feeding and during insulin resistance by the gene of so before, the sterol uh, regulatory element by the protein. And it promotes lipogenesis. So this thing here, I want to look in the database. So why this guy is so bad? And apparently it's quite, it's relatively common. It's not that rare for the effect the association effect that has been proved, we would have not expect this rate here, even in the homozygous. But uh, not only that, if we go and look at different subpopulations, and a population from uh, in the Latin American pop uh, population, it's basically half of the population, the GLE, or even more. The peak is in the Peruvian population, they have 71.2% of GLE. And the lowest rates are in the African population, and uh, also in the uh, Finnish population. You know, they are around 12% uh, um, of that. So, looking at these numbers, we can actually um, try to make sense of why the uh, alcoholic liver disease is uh, more frequent in the American subpopulation and the individual with these kind of origins. And uh, also why the same amount of alcohol seems to have more uh, deleterious effects on certain people than on others. So this is probably the most, the strongest genetic factor playing in uh, alcohol fever disease. But also, I went through some bioinformatic websites, and then again, the trend, like you can see, is that change is deleterious. But there are some websites that uh, are calling it polymorphism or polarity change. So then again, this is a change that is relatively common in the normal population, seems to have a strong association with a lot of liver diseases, 
and uh, seems to be called almost unanimously as their age. But what is the effect of this change? So like we said, the adiponutrine is a gatekeeper here, and uh, it basically regulates the size and the composition of these lipid droplets <coughs> inside the exocyte. <coughs> so, and it has been proved that with the isoleucin at a position 148, the fat content into the uh, hepatocellular um, cytoplasm is between 0 and 5%. On the other hand, with the methionine, it goes above 6%. And that is where we have the macrovesicular stethosis. This is when the vesicles become big and there is the accumulation of uh, the fat acid. So, we, we've seen what are the genetic factors for the cetosis. We've seen what is affecting uh, the amount of fat in the liver. Now, what is affecting uh, the oxidative stress? We need to focus on this gene here that you see on uh, MRF2. And uh, this gene is associated with uh, these ARE elements. These elements are associated with the response to the oxidative stress. So basically, NR NRF2 is the main mediator in the cellular, uh, in the um, liver cells, to oxidative stress. And how does it work? Basically, it links those elements in the promoted region of those genes and promote the expression of those genes. And those genes are uh, operating a, a protective, um, they are protecting the cells from the RS and from the other um, beta oxidation elements of the other oxygen uh, factors. So it has been proved that when we look at knockout mice for this gene, and we expose those to ethanol, they show increased inflammatory response, they show steatosis, they show fibrosis. Now, I have to make a comment here. The mouse model does not work very well with the alcoholic liver disorder because the mechanisms leading to cirrhosis are different. So many times uh, when we try to replicate a disorder in an animal model, the mouse works well. And for some of the components of the spectrum, it works well. For, for example, for the steatosis, it works well. But when it goes to something a little more complicated like hepatitis, fibrosis, and especially cirrhosis, it does not work. But the fact that knockout mice for NRF2 actually uh, present the symptoms when exposed to ethanol uh, actually means a lot because it means that even if the model per se is not capable of replicating most of the uh, environmental factors, it does work for this genetic factor. So now, going back to the original slide, we're talking about this, the RS here, see the cuffer cells, which are basically uh, macrophages in the liver, and uh, how they're activated by the uh, liposaccharide here through the toll light receptor 4. They release ROS, and the ROS get into the hepatocyte and promote the oxidative stress. So we've seen the part leading to the steatosis, we've seen now the part leading to the oxidative stress, but how are all these parts organized? They are organized by epigenetic changes. The amount of change that have been associated with alcoholic liver disease is among the highest in all the multifactorial diseases so far described. And there are two main components. Now, in this branch of the here, we're going to talk about the epigenetic changes, mostly microRNAs, but also um, the regulation of the balance of between methylation and acetylation of the H3K9, the uh, lysine 9 and the histone 3. But also we're going to talk a lot about the immune system. So what are generally epigenetic effects of ethanol in the liver? When uh, a high amount of ethanol reaches the uh, liver, and I'm talking about all the cells of the liver, so hepatocytes, cellate cells, uh, copper cells, what we observe is an increased level of overall DNA methylation. 
we, uh, like I mentioned, is a modification of the histones, and the main modification is the increased level of acetylation of uh, H3K9, and also a microRNA alteration that we'll see in detail. So overall, the combination of these factors will lead to uh, progression of the injury and carcinoma, so not just the original insult, so not just the cetosis or the original hepatitis, but there will be progression to fibrosis, progression to uh, cirrhosis, and then eventual carcinoma. Then other expression of genes and proteins, mostly genes associated with lipogenesis. And then here, the immunological consequences. And therefore, we have here, once again, the spectrum that we described before. The interesting thing is also the time factor, because the cell modification by ethanol in the liver changes. At first, it uh, has been described phosphorylation, then acetylation, and finally, the long-term effect is methylation. So we know that, as a general rule, the acetylation is associated with the increased gene expression and the methylation with decreased gene expression. And uh, this is particularly true uh, for some genes, for example, the production of tumor negative factor alpha by the calcar cells is uh, heavily influenced by the methylation of H3K9. <coughs> and uh, like we mentioned, in the patient in heavy drink, there is an increase of acetylation of H3K9. So it has been proved that there is a double effect. Not only the increased level of uh, uh, LPS, but also the increased expression of uh, tumor negative factor. And finally, the microRNAs. So this is just a, a picture of all the microRNAs that uh, are playing important roles in the liver. This is in a normal situation. This is usually through development. They are uh, quite time-specific, but uh, the interesting thing is the presence of this microRNA here, microRNA-122, which you can notice is also here and here, but this is expressed and is associated with uh, cell survival and cell proliferation, <coughs> and uh, it's actually inhibited when uh, something goes wrong here, when the insult of the alcohol liver disease starts here, and then progresses here and here. But this is just an overview. We're going through some of the main things uh, one by one, and then again here. You see, once again, that microRNA is decreased or increased, depending on the kind of insult. And uh, there is a plethora of microRNAs that have been proved to be affected in the, in the liver after uh, chronic uh, ethanol uh, consumption. So this is one of the uh, most um, studied factors. So the microRNA and the cell survival of the cells. It has been proved that ethanol promotes the expression of microRNA 34A and inhibits the expression of uh, 122, the one that I mentioned before. So, the 122 promotes, like we see, the cell cycle. So, by inhibiting these, you have a decrease of cell survival, and by promoting these, you promote basically um, cell death. So, you see that the effect, you have to consider this is reverse. So, this is promotes, this is inhibited, and so therefore you have a decrease of these genes, an increase of this one. So this is associated with uh, what we observe in the cirrhosis, because in the cirrhosis we have an abnormal growth rate of uh, uh, hepatocytes, but they're growing uh, without control. It's, it's almost like a tumor-like process. They're growing in response to inflammatory stimulation, and uh, they're growing out of position. So, for example, uh, one of the um, region of the liver that is showing uh, the, the highest rate of liver damage after alcohol is the perivenous lobe, lobe uh, that is also the region that expresses the highest rate of uh, C2E1, which we mentioned before as part of the cytochrome B450 uh, system. That is because that part of the cytochrome system activated by the inflammation promotes the cell proliferation, the abnormal cell proliferation, and then it promotes the cirrhotic lesions in that area of the liver. This one, gonna be quick. Um, this is a, a mechanism by itself. It's still epigenetic, but that extends by itself. 
um, it's interesting because it's a multiple step. So we have the ethanol that reduces the level of uh, CERP1 or sirtuin. Sirtuin is a deacetylase protein that works on this uh, splicing factor here, SFRS10. Now the splicing factor promotes <coughs> the splicing of exon 7 in the gene living one. Now living one has two isoforms. Like the alpha isoform is the one without exon 7 and stays in the nucleus. Staying in the nucleus it does not affect the lipid metabolism in the liver cells. Like in B, like in beta, sorry, um, keeps exon 7 and it goes into the cytoplasm. And we'll see what it does. But the, the interesting point is that uh, in heavy drinkers, uh, it has been described that both the levels of CERT1 and SFRS10 are decreased. And uh, also in uh, CERT1 knockout mice exposed to ethanol, it has been shown that. Um, Cetosis, inflammation, and uh, uh, cirrhosis have been uh, described. Now, then again, these are mice, so the model might not replicate uh, precisely what we have in humans, but still, it's significant. And uh, the thing is that once the beta isoform gets to the cytoplasm, then we have all these cascade effects, especially affecting uh, the gene encoding uh, lipogenic enzymes but also inflammatory genes, and then again we have all the elements of the spectrum, including the cousin, uh, the position in the extracellular matrix that promote uh, fibrosis. So then again, this is a, a, a small model of epigenetic regulation by ethanol that uh, proves how complex is the liver injury causing <coughs> these patients. Now, in the beginning, I mentioned the fact that uh, lipopolysaccharide, LPS, is increased. Why is that increased? Because ethanol promotes in our intestine the level of microRNA to dwell. But acetaldehyde also represses the production of high junction proteins in the zonula occludens 1, ZO1. And so both the direct effect by ethanol and the indirect effect by acetaldehyde promotes a weakening of the tight junction in the intestine. So basically, the intestine barrier gets weaker and weaker, and there is a so-called leaky barrier phenomenon that promotes the uh, circulating levels of endotoxins, <coughs> LPS, in blood and liver. So LPS reaches the liver, and there it's negated by the TLR, TLR4, receptor and uh, through some other micro uh, RNAs and the NFKB pathway, it affects the capital cells. But let's say the TLR4. This is interesting because so far we mentioned uh, most of the pathways that are in common with both alcoholic and non-alcoholic damage. TLR4 promotes two different pathways. In the alcoholic <coughs> steatohepatitis, there is a pathway that is not mediated by the MYD88 proteins, and uh, it involves the inflammasome very early, it's a very early response, and it only involves the captor cells, which are <coughs> necrophages generated by the bone marrow and that then migrate into the liver. In a non alcoholic steatohepatitis, hepatitis, the signal is mediated by the MYD88 pathway. And uh, it goes to the M chromosome later, it's not an early response, and even the hepatocytes are involved in the chromosome. So this is a, a critical point that differs the two conditions. But then going here, we see then again the microRNA, and uh, it's interesting, we see here the uh, TNF alpha, and uh, the lower production of interleukin 10. And uh, about that, we see that also here, the ethanol itself represses the production of interleukin 10. But not only that, the microRNA 155 is a key component of the inflammatory response generated by ethanol. Because it switches the differentiation of the monocytes, which are the precursor of the macrophages, including the factor cells, from the M2 
that is an anti-inflammatory <coughs> population to the M1, which is a pro-inflammatory population. And uh, also some other epigenetic effects, like uh, uh, demethylation or deacetylation are playing some roles here. But overall, the final result is that there is an increase of the inflammatory response. So then again, this is all initiated by ethanol, but not by itself, also by the microRNA produced by the hepatocytes. So just to summarize, these are all the effects that have been described in the immune system and they are all caused by excessive alcohol intake. So influence of cell recruitment or infected to infected or inflamed tissues. So the kind of cells that respond are not the ones that are supposed to. The altered profile of cytokines and chemokines. The impaired antigen presentation. The leaky barriers, we saw that with the LPS but all of, also the respiratory system is affected. The abnormal phagocytosis and granulopoiesis, and one of the uh, tests, one of the markers in blood for heavy drinkers is the deficit of granulocytes, and this is why it's closed. And then the skewed cell differentiation, like we saw, the M1 is way more represented than M2 in liver macrophages and cancer cells. And finally, the induced apoptosis, which then these two fibrosis and cirrhosis. And this is just a scheme to see the effect not only in the liver, but also in other systems. So overall, this is a schematic of uh, what we've seen in the, in the first slide, but uh, in a kind of a simple way. We have this genetic factor, the PNP, LA3, SNP, that leads to increased lipogenesis, and uh, increased risk of chronic progression. The genetic factor here, the analog 2, that uh, affects uh, uh, oxidative stress. And these genetic factors, the epigenetic um, modifications and uh, the final effect on the immune system. And of course, they communicate with each other to generate the, the spectrum uh, of the alcohol to the disease. So since it's a complex spectrum, there is also a complex approach. Knowing these genetic and molecular mechanisms is helping to develop new strategies for the treatment. So first of all, the antioxidants that are going to work on the oxidative stress, see the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria, the growth factors that might help too for the regeneration to um, compensate the increased level of uh, apoptosis. The anti-caspase, uh, we mentioned that the caspase might be affected uh, at um, later stages of uh, inflammation. Antifibrotic drugs on the cell itself, which are the main component of the um, cells producing, uh, uh, increasing the, the uh, collagen production in the extracellular matrix. Anti-inflammatory molecules on the capper cells of the other macrophages that are infiltrating the, the liver. Uh, TLR antagonists, we mentioned TLR, TLR4. And then uh, in intestine uh, to prevent um, the leakage of uh, LPS, antibiotics, probiotics, prebiotics, but also zinc that uh, affects, that actually um, contrasts uh, intestinal inflammation. So this is a list of the current uh, treatments <coughs> that apply to alcohol and liver disease. And this is just to give an idea of the different approaches. So for example, um, we can see here the leukemia one receptor antagonist anakindra, uh, rifaximine, this antibiotic. So this is actually proving how the inflammatory response is the easiest to tackle right now as a first approach. Um, but in general, it's still quite a complex approach. It's still quite complicated to to have a, a, to have a handle of, of the whole. <coughs> so in conclusion, the only genetic variant that is strongly associated so far is the uh, isoleucine to methionine 148 and it's not only associated with increased risk of developing alcoholic liver disease but also with increased risk of having the disease progressing to cirrhosis or fibrosis. There is a very complex regulatory system based on uh, epigenetic factors like the H3K9 acetylation and microRNA that uh, mediates the effect on the lipid metabolism and the uh, inflammation. And these are the key cytokines 
in the inflammatory response in ALD. <coughs> then finally, of course, really the reason why I picked this for the topic of this, of this talk, ALD is, a, a, I think, is a great model for a multifactorial disease. And uh, when we talk about multifactorial disease, we always imply there is some genetic component, some environmental component. We show that the definition of the environmental component, which is the alpha assumption, is not very clear. But still, uh, this allows us to actually uh, study how three different pathways are interacting, are communicating, and are actually leading to a complex disease, which is affecting society in a very, very heavy way. And then finally, to answer the original question, if you want to get wine, I would say that uh, I haven't been taken sir, for the younger people in the audience, this guy, this is Bond. <laughs> the real James. The real James. <laughs>